When I visited Japan, I had a couple of questions. Why do high school girls wear sailor uniforms? Why are their cartoons so weird? Why does their cuisine have so much bastardized western food? And why are there cafes where the waitresses only wear maid outfits? For a long time, I've dismissed these phenomena as cultural anomalies, born of the weird dispositions of Japan's cultural innovators. But slowly a pattern formed. Convenience stores, consumer electronics, toys, anime, video games, J-Rock, and more. This is seemingly just a list of iconic Japanese stuff, but there is something else. Underneath these icons' youthful facades lies a very old, unspoken tradition that you can see, shining through the cracks of all of these things if you just look closely. And that tradition is cultural appropriation. These cultural elements all have two things in common. One, they are all iconically Japanese and form a part of the Japanese identity. Two, none of them originated in Japan. Japan has a rich history particularly after the Second World War, of adopting cultural elements and icons from other countries. But it doesn't end there. The real interesting thing is that they not only adopt these elements, they turn this foreign cultural material into their own thing. By removing foreign cultural material from their original contexts and injecting their uniquely Japanese sensibilities into them, these elements are transformed, mutated, you could even say, into things Japanese. This process of cultural mutation may be why we, as non-Japanese, find sailor outfits on schoolgirls so jarring on first sight. The clothes that they're wearing are pretty clear cases of cultural appropriation of the West, but they seem as if they're Japanese inventions. Well, that is kind of because sailor outfits, as high school uniforms, really are Japanese inventions. The design and origin of these clothes may not be uniquely Japanese, but the cultural connotations are. Now that we've established a bit of theory, let's take a dive into history to see how anime is also a product of this cultural mutation. This is from Momotaro's Divine Sea Warriors, released in 1945. During the Second World War, the vast majority of Japanese animation was war propaganda, and although its quality was not terrible, the original American works had the infrastructure and experience to create far more detailed and smooth animation. In 1941, the Imperial military screened a copy of Fantasia, discovered aboard a captured American transport ship for propaganda filmmakers. The idea was that they might better know the enemy. It seems to have worked. One of the men in attendance was so moved by its craftsmanship that he burst into tears at the finale. Although we see some divergence of the Japanese animation from the American one, what we see in Momotaro's Divine Sea Warriors is still quite distant from what most of us know as Japan's unique brand of modern anime. The first significant instance of cultural mutation can be attributed to Osamu Tezuka, the creator of Mighty Adam, or as the West has come to know it, Astro Boy. This is a manga by the name of Lost World, published in 1948. Operating in a legal and ethical gray zone on an alien planet, a scientist uses plant matter to create two women, Ayame and Momiji. Scheming to sell these plant girls, the scientist gives them sexually attractive forms. In this scene, the main character, also a scientist, realizes their only means of transport off the alien planet is gone, leaving one of the plant girls and him stranded on the planet. And if you thought manufacturing sexually alluring plant girls for sale wasn't sketchy enough, he then says, let's become brother and sister. And she replies, I'd be so glad to become your little sister. To which he then says, we are now king and queen of this alien planet. And at this point, it might not be surprising that she hits him with the Oni -sama. where Oni means big brother and Sama is an honorific showing subordination to whoever it's attached to. However you look at it, this manga is fucked up. What seems at first glance like a children's comic book story is deeply embedded with an ambiguous and complex amalgam of adult themes. Cartoons are a children's medium because they protect children from the often harsh reality of life. Tezuka and Japan were okay with stripping that veil away and exposing their children to adult themes from a young age. 
According to cultural critic Eiji Otsuka, Tezuka's attribution of quote reality to quote unrealistic forms allowed for post-war manga and anime to explore literary themes. When cute characters made for children are allowed to die and experience real adult emotions like in Tezuka's Lost World, suddenly whole new dimensions of possibility open up for manga authors. Whereas they were traditionally limited to children's stories, as in the West, Japanese creators could now write anything. From Lost World onwards, Tezuka continued to explore adult and literary themes in his work. He is now crowned the god of manga, capturing a whole generation of young minds with the Astro Boy anime, and influencing his generation and the ones after to create anime, the Japanese kind without boundaries. It's no wonder you can find anime for any subject matter now. Hear it from YGG Studios Beatrice, formerly known as Digibro. Nowhere else in the world will you find over 50 episodes of meditative, low-key, some might even say boring episodic adventures through a beautifully drawn rural countryside where nothing all that exciting usually happens. Nowhere else will there be the same number of episodes dedicated to young girls sailing around a Martian Venetia, quietly learning about life and coming of age without any kind of action. Nowhere else will 12 episodes of College Ennui be unloaded in a visually esoteric blend of metaphors high-speed dialogue and creative use of repetition. Nowhere else will a high school full of hot girls beating the shit out of each other be used as a metaphor for the history of cultural imperialism. And those are just the things that you can get without even really trying. Adult and therefore literary themes. This is what Japan injected into the Western concept of cartoons, making them anime. Ever wondered how this interviewer can go up to some random person in Akihabara, ask them what their favorite anime is, and they'll be able to respond, giving reasons for why they like it? It's because people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s don't outgrow anime. The literary themes that anime explores extend into the adult world, and therefore so does its viewership. And this is not to say that American animation is totally confined to children's entertainment. Well, I gotta leave. The Simpsons is a centerpiece of Western pop culture and has garnered audiences of all ages. The difference between US animation and Japanese anime is the sheer freedom of expression that Tezuka's and the creators after him brought about. While Western cartoons are largely still episodic comedies or adventures, anime is just all over the place. This is not to say either that there are no children's anime. Anime did not break away from its roots as children's entertainment. It merely expanded the medium's potential range of themes. Anime's unique dynamic exists because a children's medium is treated as literature by its creators and consumers. While anime and animation in Japan evolved and matured into its unique Japanese brand, Western comic book writers were constrained, mired by something called the Comics Code of 1954. Created based on concerns over juvenile delinquency, it strictly regulated what writers could explore. You can pause the video here to take a look at the official code criteria. I've highlighted a couple of the more atrocious ones. As the spheres of comic artists and animators overlapped significantly, American animation was also stifled by this cage. Contrast this artistic environment to Japan's at the time, where demand was driven not only by children but by adults as well, and it isn't surprising that you have shows like Fist of the North Star, which were based off of manga. <laughs> Diverging from animation's western roots, Japan made anime its own by allowing the development of adult and literary themes. This is just another example of Japan's tendency to appropriate foreign culture and Japanize it. Their tendency to appropriate, assimilate, and make foreign things their own isn't limited to cultural material either. They've done the same with Western technology to significant outcomes. 7-Eleven currently dominates the convenience store market. The chain opened its first store in 1974 as a Japanese incarnation of American Southland Corporation 7-Eleven. Growing its business by employing distinctly Japanese distribution strategies, 7-Eleven is now a ubiquitous Japanese icon. Japanese cars enter the global market as smaller, more reliable, and more fuel-efficient versions of their Western templates. In the 80s and 90s, Japanese electronics gained hegemony in global markets for their efficiency of space and high quality. 
Japanese video games dominated the scene as well with the Famicom and the NES systems in the 80s and 90s, saturating both domestic and western markets. All of these Japanese hardware developments had one thing in common, reliability and simplicity. And the reason for Japanese products having these conveniently advantageous traits is entirely cultural. The word shokunin means Japanese artisan, but it also embodies the tradition of Japanese artisanry. The requirement to pour your heart and soul into the craft because the shokunin's craft was just their lot in life, ordained by the social order of their era. The tradition places innovation secondary to the mastering of form, finish, and presentation. You might call it thinking inside the box. This deeply rooted tradition may be one of the reasons why modern Japanese hardware is usually a product of appropriating Western concepts and refining them in a way only a people with the shokunin spirit can. In Japan, a nation where the 1300-year-old Ise Grand Shrine is demolished and expertly rebuilt every 20 years, the line between original and replica has long been blurred. In Japan, the word copy lacks the pejorative meaning that it often carries in Western societies. In Japan, where the process of creation begins with an imitation, it is the copy that often signals the beginning of something new.